Thank you, Angela. A lot of information there, and um, I'm sure a lot of people will want to see uh, the presentation slides. So our next speaker uh, is Stephen Dowling, and he will talk to us about building psychological resilience. Thank you, Stephen. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for, for coming today. It's, uh, I've spent uh, a number of years in Tasmania working in residential aged care and uh, child welfare and family services with the Baptist Church, so it's great to uh, return to the mainland. In terms of the presentation today, I'm going to take you through uh, some context and background, some of the issues that a Angela's touched on I'll fly over so we can get through the material. And uh, all of the slides that you have uh, will be provided to you, so uh, there's no need to uh, take copious notes. You'll get them uh, streamed through to you at the end of the presentation. The problem with uh, mental illness is that it's one in five, and uh, normally when uh, we focus on, on one in five, we look around our table and we think, well, which one of us is it today? The way I like to think about one in five is think about everyone that comes to your kitchen table, family, friends, neighbours, Think about all of those people that you connect with in your everyday life, all of those people that you have on Facebook, and expand the one in five concept out through those groups of people. And you'll find that uh, some, uh, at some stage in their life, may suffer from some form of mental illness. The costs associated with the financial impact of uh, mental illness is, is stark, uh, and the numbers are real. And uh, you'll find with all of these uh, slides, at the bottom of the slide is the reference material that we work with. I tend not to throw up numbers that are, uh, are dodgy numbers. I'm not into uh, Trump's fake news. Uh, and I tend to work with uh, evidence-based research, as um, Angela does as well. The frightening statistic, and this statistic comes from Mental Health First Aid Australia, is that 78% of people that have a, a mental illness do not seek treatment. And that's a number that we need to reduce as we move forward with any strategy that we put into place. So if we imagine we've got 500 people, 100 of those people could be struggling in any given population. Of those 100 people, 78 choose not to seek treatment. And that's a frightening statistic in anyone's mind. Uh, among those uh, that, um, that uh, take sick leave, almost 48% do not disclose uh, the reason uh, to anyone, and the length of delay in help seeking uh, is the strongest predictor of long-term uh, sick leave. So they're the sort of issues that I want to focus on today, and uh, similar to Angela, I tend to work in pracademia, so we'll focus on practical actions that you can take. The speaker that will visit you next month is my business partner, Dr Natasha Lazareski, and she'll dive into detail around each of these programs so you can actually experience at an individual or a personal level what these pro programs can feel like for you. So this is stage one of two presentations you'll see over the next couple of months. The burden of mental illness, you can see, strikes many in the community at prime working years. Uh, the uh, red line is female, the uh, black line is male, and these are statistics that were produced in, in 2013. Mental illness tends to uh, occur most during prime years. It's an extra workload on co-workers and supervisors, and people will carry people a very long way to support people that are going through difficult times, but eventually they have enough. They can only do so much for people. Or, and what normally happens is their life takes over uh, the issue, so they find they can't carry people anymore. So what I tend to see in workplaces that I work with is a degree of frustration uh, with the person that could be struggling with mental illness, particularly if their co-workers and or supervisors feel that they're not trying to get their act together, they're not trying to do what's uh, encouraged, they, they, they start to run out of energy in supporting them. It's a big issue for workplaces all around the world. One in five takes sick leave due to a mental health illness problem. The longer the sick leave, the less likely to return to work. And as the mental illness uh, continues, uh, people then struggle uh, to hold down a job, uh, unemployment, and eventually uh, early retirement. So we're losing people from our workforce that are valuable contributors that may have worked years and years and years uh, in, uh, in strong, committed uh, work roles, but then find, for one reason or another, and I need to say this, you'll hear me say this a few times today, through no fault of their own they get struck down with an illness 
and they just can't find the strength, the energy or the support to bounce back. Uh, the workplace uh, is really our home away from home and uh, for all of us uh, in the workplace we're going to spend 11 years of our life uh, at, at our workplaces. It takes up a lot of time, it takes up a lot of energy, it draws a lot of commitment from us and we share a lot of commitment with others that we work with. The workplace can be one of three things. It can be engaging, uplifting and satisfying, in other, work, uh, in other words, work is good for you, uh, or it can be traumatising, disengaging and harmful and it can be a big risk factor in some people's lives. Or thirdly, and clearly why you're all here today, it, a workplace can be an environment that we, where we can learn and grow. It can be a setting for positive intervention, particularly for those that are struggling amongst your workforce. Um, let's look at workplace as a protective factor. The research uh, is clear that work is good for people. Long-term absence, work disability, uh, unemployment can have a negative impact on both physical and psychological health. The research on this issue is overwhelming and consistent. So what we need to do is try to put in place work practices, work cultures that keep people effectively at work and performing well at work. Let's look at workplace as a risk factor. Uh, there's, uh, I'll give you some ac ac academic research, but rather than links, I'll, I'll take, you, take you through some of the key concepts. Uh, what does the law say in terms of psychosocial risk management, and we'll hear more about this from our next speaker, is that it's a hazard like any other. You have to identify uh, so, 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 psychosocial hazards, identify the causes, and look to put in place uh, risk controls around those issues. Who tends to go when you see a, a physical risk in a work, workplace to the uh, hierarchy of control to manage that risk? Put your hands up if you use the hierarchy of control to manage risk. Uh, for those that are uh, streaming uh, online, most of the hands went up around the room. When you apply the hierarchy of control to psychological risk, does it work? Put your hand up if you think yes. There is no hand up in the room. It doesn't work. It's the wrong tool for the wrong set of issues. And there are some tools around the, the world, and particularly in Australia, one of the reasons I'm speaking here today, Pam saw me speak at a, uh, a psychological uh, injury management conference last year, and I asked people to put their hands up in the room if they came from Tasmania. There was only one person there, and that was Pam. I then told everyone else in the room, if you want to see best practice in research, forget about the Eastern Seaboard. Go straight to Tasmania. Tasmania is doing more than any state, and, and South Australia as well. Um, are doing more in any state in this country on protecting their workforce from psychosocial injuries. So I'm pleased to be speaking here today to echo that again to you guys. In terms of the um, issues and psychosocial hazards, Angela took us through a range of them. Uh, there's new forms of employment contracts and job insecurity. There's poor work-life balance. There's work intensification and long hours. There's high emotional demands at work particularly those that work within the healthcare industry. I've worked extensively in the healthcare industry and I see the impact that caring for others has on the carers. Uh, but unfortunately, with the exception of Tasmania, um, our society tends not to focus on those that care in society. Um, my wife and I, Kimberly and I, we've dedicated our life uh, to working for the carers or caring for the carers that care for others in our society. And I think it's a, it's a population, it's a workforce that's overlooked in terms of the commitment and the strength that they bring to, and strength that they build into a community. There's better practices uh, around the world. Uh, put your hand up if you've seen this research from Canada. There we are. We've got two, two people in the room, three people in the room. Uh, I presented to 2,000 people last year in Western Australia. Only one person in the room put their hand up. Sometimes we need to look outside of our, um, ourselves, outside of our island, sometimes look across the pond to see if we can draw in better practice research. This is one tool that can help. Uh, who has read the research uh, of the Australian Workplace Barometer? Comes out of South Australia. Angela mentioned it more. Three or four hands, four or five hands around the room. That's fantastic because what we can do is we can harness this research 
inside uh, of our own country and share and collaborate with others. It's really impactful research because it gives you something that we're looking for in managing psychosocial risk, and that's a risk management framework that tends to work. Uh, it's a different approach to uh, risk assessment of psychological risk, and it replaces the traditional hierarchy of control. It could be a tool that could benefit everyone in this room. I'd encourage you to, when you get the presentation, have a look at the material. It is a little difficult to read. It's an academic paper, but it's worth reading. What does it do? It looks at what policies that you have in place, what implementation and responsibility uh, anchors that you have in your organisation, what level of managerial support uh, is in place, how are your jobs designed, and what are the individual factors that actually drive workplace improvement in reducing the risk of psychosocial injury. And it came from South Australia. Uh, and there are very few people that really know about this level of work. So one of the reasons of coming here today is to share these uh, tools and opportunities with you. It's worth a read. Uh, Angela took us through uh, psychosocial risk in, uh, in its domains around all of these issues of job content, workload and workplace, work schedule, control over work, environment and equipment, organisational culture, interpersonal relationships, career development, and work home interference is what we talk about. Who carries an iPhone? Put your hand up if you've got a smartphone. How often does it go on the weekend? <laughs> How many people respond to it every minute of every day? It's a different world that we're working in now. And this um, homework interference uh, is a real challenge for most people. Now, this slide is quite interesting. It looks sort of easy to read when it's virtually just sitting here as a a slide, you know, piece of, piece of paper on a slide pack. In reality, when you do the research, as Angela has done with uh, other organisations, it's complicated. It's very complicated. When you, do, uh, when you actually put all of these sorts of issues through a rigorous methodology and through computer uh, modelling, these are the sorts of relationships that you start to detect. They're the things that you can then really start to focus on in your workplaces that can make a difference. It does help if you've got the power of a computer to actually work through this stuff. But that's how complicated it is. It's more complicated uh, than just bullet points on a slide. And uh, anyone that works in this field, anyone that's struggling in a workplace to understand these issues, understands that reality. What are the risk controls? The risk controls need to be at three levels, organisational, operational and individual. I'll take you through more detail in that uh, shortly. Uh, and you need to draw in the best that you can with, in terms of resources around any community. Um, I'm a community ambassador for the AUA pro, Are You OK program and, and have been for many years. When I s first started wearing this badge, people used to come up to me in airports and say, what does RUOC stand for? Uh, <laughs> For people that don't know, Are You OK has three paid part-time staff, a small group of volunteers like myself, there's about 30, 35, and when we started off uh, eight years ago, it was like standing at the top of a, a sort of ski jump. Uh, I've never done that, of course, but when you look down, you think, how are we going to get there? How, how is this going to, how are we going to maintain momentum? Uh, how will this work? So that small group of people and its founding uh, members uh, have now created a program that one in four Australians actually recognise and understand and practice. And it's created in most workplaces an environment where it's okay to, understand, uh, to share concerns, to con share anxieties and share if you're struggling uh, within your organisation. You need to put in a number of, uh, a number of building blocks, uh, EAPs that are effective and, and well monitored and we're hearing from Converge uh, when we're um, doing a discussion panel later. Workplace chaplaincy, some people have a spiritual need. Uh, I've worked with the Catholic Church, the Anglican Church and the Baptist Church uh, and spirituality for people is a growing need uh, for many in the workforce. Having access to workplace chaplains can be helpful. Uh, I'll talk a little about mental health first aid and I'll take you through some of the SciFlex material uh, that Natasha, will, Dr. Natasha, will take you through uh, in next month's presentation in great detail. Um, what's needed? Innovation, innovative programs, uh, early intervention resources, as I outlined, creating stay at work programs to assist those that remain at work 
whilst they deal with their health concerns, while they're battling on, put the time, the, invest the time, the energy and the support around people as they struggle through, as they try to get control and better manage their lives, it reaps great benefits not only to them, to their supervisors, to their co-workers and ultimately the organisation because it demonstrates the organisation reflects care and understanding. It sounds corny, but if you want performance in an organisation, it's very simple. Demonstrate care and understanding to people, particularly service-oriented uh, service organisations, and they just fly. Uh, collaborate with workers and managers to create detailed return to work plans and anticipate that there could be a relapse. People come back to work with the best of intentions and then they run into a obstacle uh, or they run into a barrier to their return to work and they may relapse, be able to help pick them up and get them back on track as you move forward. Uh, I talked about the need to integrate services. There's three ways that you can look at this, well, two ways you can look at this slide. One, uh, you've got to have communication, reporting, analysis and commitment. Uh, underpinning everything that you do because as soon as you, people in today's world can pick insincerity one part per billion. As soon as you deviate from that, you're lost. You'll lose the, um, the workforce and uh, you'll find that programs will stall. The other area that I mentioned that was important was to work at a individual, a team and an organisational level. This is a pretty useful slide uh, and it you build resilience at an individual level. You manage team support and fatigue management because teams do struggle uh, when they're hit with complexity and ambiguity. And you put in place at an organisational level policy systems and training. How you make sense of this slide? Individual or uh, team, organisation. Prevention, early intervention, ongoing support. What's been my journey in uh, workplace wellness over the last two decades? I started off with ongoing support for people that were basically broken. I then moved into working with people around early intervention methodologies. I now work with uh, Dr. Russ Harris and Dr. Natasha Lazareski around prevention. How can we ensure that we build robust systems, robust knowledge, build in psychological resilience to, to uh, individuals, teams and organisations, particularly as they go through pressurised situations, so we need less early intervention we less ongoing support. Does that slide make sense? It looks very simple when you put it on a slide. That's 25 years of learning on one piece of paper. It takes you 25 years to get there. I think above all, you've got to collaborate with uh, all stakeholders, uh, including uni uh, unions. Um, collaborate with stakeholders, in particular OHS committees, and garner support. Uh, do we have any union delegates, union organisers in the room? None today. Unions are confronted with uh, particular issues and uh, I've worked for mining companies for half of my life and worked with unions, came out of uh, a town called Broken Hill. Some of you would know Broken Hill and the union situation there. And uh, worked, with, worked with unions uh, virtually all my life and learned to work with unions very well. Union delegates, union organisers are struggling with members that are coming to them with these sorts of issues and not knowing what to do. And actually looking to employers for help in supporting those that could be struggling in their workplaces. Really an important message to get out. Work with unions to co-design models of care and link up with the mental health clinicians in your community. Don't exclude people, get people involved. Why do I like coming to a Tasmania? You guys collaborate with one another. You don't wait for someone from Sydney or Melbourne to come and solve your problems. You work out what's needed, you do the best that you can and you draw on the resources around you to make it happen. How good is that? That's what uh, others in the other island uh, above us need to, uh, need to understand. Uh, engage and share learnings where pos possible with other employers and encourage all to take a broad long-term view of the bottom line impact. It's a bit like the, hair, the, you know, the Pantene hair commercial. You're not going to get financial results overnight, but you will get them. Uh, one of my uh, sins is I'm a public accountant. So I'm always looking at numbers. So uh, over the years, I've been able to draw together for organisations. If you invest in this, it will make a difference and you watch the numbers move over time. But you've got to have patience. It, it won't happen in the next quarter, but it does happen. Uh, in terms of psychological support policies and procedures, uh, provide early intervention resources, um, clinical assessments where needed around psychological function and the uh, inherent requirements, psychological requirements of the role, 
create stay-at-work programs I've mentioned, collaborate with, uh, with workers and managers to create detailed re return-to-work plans and manage those relapses. Uh, but that's an ongoing communication issue uh, within the organisation. People need to know, even though you're maining, always managing confiden confidentiality, confidentiality out, let me say that again, confidentiality and privacy type issues, it's really important if people know that they can step forward, step, fo step forward in trust, and they need to know what services are available to them and how to access them, when to use them. Uh, there's a reality gap. If you speak, uh, I'm always speaking to boards and uh, people at the top of the organisation, yeah, look, everything's fine. Uh, er, you know, we're, we're, we're turning a dollar, uh, we're delivering services, we're hitting our KPIs, I should get my short-term incentive payment next week. These are the sorts of conversations that I hear. Uh, but then when I uh, work, move into the workforce, I hear, um, you know, th there's a level of uh, discontent, there's a level of uh, concern, and there seems to be a, a major disconnect between what people say at the top and what people work at different levels in the organisation reflect. There is this sort of organisational reality gap. Don't know whether anyone experiences uh, that in their organisation from time to time. The other issue is there's organisational radios that are playing. If you think of every person in your organisation as a, an organisational radio, and um, each person brings with them uh, the pain from the past, the problems of the present, and the fears about the future. And those negative thoughts impact people in the way they interact with others, the way they cope within themselves, and part of the SciFlex methodology is to unpack that issue at an individual, team, and organisational level. How do you do that? You start with cavemen. Cavemen told us how to solve people problems. We used to work in tribes. Um, we go to the football in groups. We are tribal type people. Sitting to the, here today, we're a group of people around a community of practice that's come together around a specific set of issues to try and solve it. We don't try and sit in a room by ourselves and solve it by ourselves. We want to do things together. Um, everyone's put your hand up if you've got a Facebook account. Uh, for those that are streaming, every hand went up in the room. Did you notice my hand didn't go up? Um, my daughters won't allow me to have a, a Facebook page because they feel I'm checking up on them. Um, what you need to do, and we've done this with uh, the eWorkbox um, uh, platform, is create a workplace community. So people aren't using external Facebook to communicate one another about work problems, this, that, and everything else, and access resources, and go to the internet, and all of that sort of stuff. We've created a work box, or e-workbox platform, where people are actually using this platform to connect community as a practice around particular sets of issues that are of interest to them. So we're harnessing digital technology to help people learn, because we've found, particularly with the younger generation, they trust more on the internet, and they trust more on their iPhone, than they do from any other source of information. And whatever's on the internet, whatever's on this platform, it, it's all got to be real. You know, I saw a unicorn on the inter internet the other day, so unicorns have to be real. Um, that's the sort of technology you need to deploy. It's not expensive, it's relatively easy to use, and if you've got a geographically spread workforce, it's the best way of communicating with one another. So we do it internally using eWorkbox. So we have all of these facilities that actually promote the communication, the awareness, People start talking to one another around their issues, their benefits, uh, sharing their stories, and it just, uh, just grows. We put in place websites, what you can't see on this website, and this one was done for emergency services. The three big issues, and I worked um, in emergency services, the triple zero service in Victoria, uh, for a couple of years uh, developing this material for them, uh, because triple zero call takers and dispatchers hear the most terrible things. You can't imagine what they hear in a day, and it impacts them significantly. So this was a website that was created that then dealt with uh, psychological risk and how to manage it, physical risk and how to manage it, including beneath these drop-down menus, lots and lots and lots and lots of resources that were relevant to the issues that that workforce felt. And the other big issue over here, and um, that's a person counting pennies, uh, is financial issues. 43% of marriages collapse because of financial pressure. What a terrible statistic that is. So we provided people access 24-7, uh, and once again, this was housed outside of the organisation, to better manage information awareness around psychological issues, 
physical issues and financial issues and put together a, help, a, a, a group of tools, resources that they could access, share with themselves, share with their families, share with their kids, share with their parents, um, share with their neighbours in terms of that sort of uh, level of information. Um, psychological report, uh, support has to have workplace training uh, and I'll take you through a little material around the mental health first aid training program. I'm a mental health first aid instructor and we focus on mental health issues in Australia. We then develop a mental health action plan and we focus on the issues, the risk factors, the signs, the symptoms, the treatments, both uh, clinical and non-clinical treatments for depression, anxiety, psychosis, substance abuse, and what to do if you find someone in a mental health crisis, which can be quite scary. Uh, put your hand up if you're a uh, first aider in the room. Yep, uh, for those streaming, uh, the majority of the hands went up around the room. Put your hand up if you're a mental health first aider. Here we go, we've got a couple. We've got a couple of people that I can see that I've trained a long time ago. And um, yeah, it's great to see you again, Lynn. And um, it's, it's skills that you can, uh, that can not only help you at work, but can help you when you bump into people in the community. Uh, at drop off and pick up times from school, at uh, sport, at uh, any of the social groups you interact with. What it does, the mental health first aid program is equip you of how to recognise the signs and symptoms with a person that has a chronic issue like depression uh, or anxiety and how to provide support for them and encourage them to seek medical care. Uh, if the person's in a crisis, so they're having suicide ideation uh, or they're having a panic attack, you then know what to do until emergency help can arrive. It's that simple and uh, can be easily trained. Psychological resilience training, uh, this is what you'll learn more about next year, uh, sorry, next month, uh, from Natasha, is how to deal with uh, trauma in your life, how to deal with uh, bullying and incivility, how to build greater flexibility, psycho psychological flexibility, in how you interact with others and how you interact with those negative thoughts that are within inside you that surface from time to time, and how you can manage them by not focusing on them too much. Not ignoring them, but not letting them have uh, too great an influence on your behaviour. Uh, how to deal with physical pain, how to deal with uh, breaking bad habits, and how to deal with sleeping disorders. So I encourage you to come next month and uh, listen to Dr Natasha. Briefly, how does the system work? Uh, it, um, it works around challenging situations that occur in your life, and pointing out to people at an individual, a team, or an organisational level, when these challenging situations arrive, people have choice. They may not think that they have choice, but they have choice. Uh, they can choose to move um, away from the person that they'd like to be uh, towards um, ineffective uh, behaviours and uh, problem behaviours, or they can move towards uh, behaviours that uh, provide a greater sense of self and really the person that they want to be. The programs teach you how to recognise thoughts, feelings and urges and how to unhook from them when you get hooked on those negative thoughts and how to focus more on your values, your skills and use mindfulness to move forward. Um, particularly when these issues happen, new management, deadlines, um, any of those sorts of organisational changes that spur in people these sorts of thoughts. They don't like me, they don't know anything, they're not good enough. Um, I've tried it before, I won't work. I can't imagine any of us have heard any of these comments in uh, organisational change. Uh, I'm not good enough in terms of made, meeting the challenge that's uh, uh, in front of me. So the programs focus on how to um, acknowledge those uh, negative thoughts and feelings and not be blindsided by them and how to uh, cling to the things that are important to you as a person and your values and to give you greater clarity around the decisions and the behaviours that you make given the choice that, sta that stands before you. So as I said, you'll hear more about that from Dr Natasha next month. Um, in terms of psychological support, culture and values comes into play. You've got to eliminate um, stigmatisation of those facing mental health. You need to develop formal and informal networks, incorporate best practices as I've outlined around primary, secondary and tertiary prevention levels of mental health issues and create, create a workplace culture where it's safe to actually discuss uh, health issues without fear of discrimination. 
What are some recommendations that you can take away from today's presentation? Uh, implement training that builds self-awareness and develops psychological resilience, develop supports that focus on increasing help-seeking behaviour, and develop targeted solutions that, uh, particularly as Angela mentioned, uh, the different at-risk groups that you may find in your community and uh, your workplace community, developing ongoing support services that reduce stigma and address mental health literacy. What's the reflection for me in putting this presentation together? Uh, it's workers uh, are really uh, afraid to reach out for help, um, yet the majority of mental illnesses can be treated. People just don't know that they can be treated. Um, and it, allowing people to recover and remain productive at work is really a sort of my life mission. Um, what are the, the actions that you're going to take? There will never be a perfect set of actions. You're going to step out in your organisations on a journey that's going to take many years to accomplish. You have to start somewhere. You won't get it right, 100% right first time, but making the effort's important. Choose the actions that are most likely to accomplish positive outcomes while generating the fewest potential problems. And finally, most people are afraid to raise mental health issues and most feel that we, particularly the collective we in this room, won't be supportive and cannot help. If you're concerned about someone, simply ask them, are you okay? And then know what to do next if they say they're not, uh, they're not okay. Take care everyone and uh, I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, and, and again for, for the effort of flying into Tasmania and sharing your expertise with us. Uh, I'm Cameron. I'm uh, just doing a quick transition here, but a uh, big thank you to Stephen for, um, for, for his presentation today and, and sharing that knowledge. And obviously, the, as, he, as he mentioned, the 25-year journey uh, took a lot out of that, particularly the, the action bit, which is what today's about. So just as we transition the lapel mic between speakers, um, I'd like you to stand up. Uh, Grab someone, or not, not grab them probably, just speak to them. Uh, and the live streamers, hopefully you've got someone in the room as well that you can talk to. I want you to take, th uh, each partner gets 30 seconds. Uh, what's, what's some of the key takeaways from Stephen's presentation or Ange earlier on that you can take away and implement an action back into your workplace? So 30 seconds, we'll do a quick changeover and our next speaker will be on stage.